Thank you for listening to this message from River of Life Worship Center. We hope you were inspired, challenged, and blessed. If you would like more information about our church, visit our website at rolwc.net. I am excited this morning as we continue our series uh, in the book of Acts. We have started on Acts chapter 1, and believe it or not, we are all the way into Acts chapter 21. So if you could take your uh, Bibles and, and turn there with me. I want to share with you uh, some, some truths about the Apostle Paul, and, and uh, we are going to take a great look at, a good look at his, his, uh, his life. Um, it is uh, just an honor to, uh, to share and teach the Word of God and, and just be able to do that together and with you and um, I'm just praying that today that uh, all of us get something out of um, these two chapters. We're going to look at chapter 21. We're also going to look at chapter 22. I want us to read together, um, follow along with me in Acts chapter 21. And then in Acts chapter 22, we are going to see that on the screen and, and kind of go through Acts chapter 22. And if you've been with us here at River of Life for any length of time, you are probably saying, Dale, that is going to be an impossibility that you're going to get through two chapters in 40 minutes. But it will happen. Maybe 43 minutes. Okay? You with me? All right, All right here we go. We're going to look at Acts chapter 21. We're going to start at verse 27. When you come to this portion of Scripture, Paul is being arrested. He is being accused of something that he did not do. His character is being maligned. He is, he is literally, unless this, this uh, Roman guard came to save his life, we're going to see in a minute, would have been torn apart. But he's, he's going to be arrested. And then in chapter 22, he's going to stand in front of these people that have come to the Passover. And they are, there are tens of thousands. Some theologians think about even over 100,000 people that are, are filtering in, pilgriming, pilgriming in to the city during this time. And so in chapter 21 and verse 27, it says, when the seven days were almost completed, this is this Passover time, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is a man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had, <clears throat> for they had previously seen Trophimus, the, the Ephesian, with him in the city. And they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple. And at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came from the tribune of the cohort, cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired, he inquired who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, another, and something else. And he could not learn the facts because of the uproar. So he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed him, crying out, away with him. As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? He said, do you know Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian who recently stirred up a revolt and led 4,000 men of the assassins out of the wilderness? Paul replied, I'm a Jew from Tarsus, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he had given him permission, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when they were there, there was a great hush. He addressed them in he the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I make before you. This is a very, very negative situation. 
Paul is in trouble. He is going to get ready to be thrown in prison. He has been beaten. He is bruised. He is, a negative, he is in a negative situation. But we are going to see today how he turns that situation because some of the principles that we are going to look at, he followed. And it turned into a positive situation. I'm sure, and I know it's true of myself, but every single person here has gone through a, a trial, a situation that you may have not understood. Why am I going through this? What is the purpose of this? Something that maybe you or I perceived as, as negative. So much so that you and I even wondered, how is this going to turn around? How could even God use this situation for, for any type of, of good? And, and I want you to remember this as we walk through all of this. Jesus told us that in this life, we would have problems, that we would have trials, that we would face things that we didn't understand. In fact, in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, it says this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, will walk through some hard times, will walk through negative, difficult situations. But Paul also says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 12, because this is true, because uh, pelted all through the word of God, it talks about trials we face, Paul says, Put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. We are going to face trouble, but God is going to help us and wants to help us. I don't know if you remember, it's been maybe a month ago, and remember I had two doors up here. If you've been with us, we were looking to figure out the will of God, and there was a big red door and a green door, even though with the lighting it looked yellow to you, but it was actually green, and I promise it was. But um, we were trying to show through the word of God that sometimes God is the God of the closed door, and he's also the God of the open door. So we have to know his will. And I, I, and I just have this, this battery here because I just want you to get this visual as we walk through this uh, scripture. We have been talking about being ignited by the Spirit of God. That is the, our whole concept of this year. That our verse is Psalm 51.10, God created me a, a pure heart, ignite something in me, renew something in me. And so when we face negative situations, and, and we, we, we will, so that's a, that's a fact. And, and let's, present, let's pretend this, this battery is, is the inside of us, the spirit of God that dwells inside of us, that God wants to work something very powerful in all of us. And so we're in a negative situation unless we take the positive, which we're going to see these principles. The foundation of the positive is the word of God, is trusting in God himself. And so when we allow the positive, when we allow principles in the word of God to be attached to the problems that we face, the situations that we face, the hardships we face, Things when we look at God and just say, I don't understand this. I just don't understand. Once we, we understand and we're, we're going to talk through it, and we put that positive spin, if you will, that positive foundation, which is the word of God and principles in the word of God, then what happens? This thing, this battery is ignited. It comes alive. And it takes us, because it, hopefully it's in a car or a motorcycle or something that is powered, and it brings us to the destination that we want to go. In this case, we're going to see the destination that God wants us to go. Are you following me? Okay? So, when we face negative situations, what principles then can help us 
turn that into a positive testimony. And in Acts chapter 21 and Acts chapter 22, Paul, through his own negative situation, shows us how to do that. So the first thing that I want you to see, the first principle is this. When we're walking, when we're in a trial, when we're in a, in a place that we don't understand or even a temptation, we, we have to accept the situation as being from God. You say, Dale, what do you mean? Well, we do serve a sovereign God who is alive and who is active in our life. The psalmist says this in Psalm chapter 37. He says, the steps of a person, the steps of a man, of a, of a righteous person are established by the Lord. When, look at this, he or she delights in his ways. So we're not talking about perfection here because no one in this room, including myself, is perfect. We all sin, we mess up, we fall short. But if our heart is being directed, our steps, we want to walk in the ways of the Lord. He is going, the Bible says, he will direct us. So when we are living in obedience to the Lord, loving him with all of our heart, when we are serving him, when we are following him, then guess what? We can have a confidence and have the confidence that the situations we face are either from the Lord or at the very least allowed by him. And that fact gives us confidence and gives us strength and, and understanding, which may not be our own, to, to follow God and deal with the trials or the situations that we don't understand that we are going to face in this, this life. Now, if we're not walking wholeheartedly before the Lord, then we lose that confidence and forfeit so much in the way of stability because it's God's desire to develop us. It's God's desire to deploy us. It's God's desire that he may show his glory through us. Why? So that he can work miraculous power both in our heart, given us grace, given us supernatural wisdom, given us understanding to, to follow after him and given us a chance to show people the difference in how a Christian faces struggle, how a Christian faces things they don't understand, how a Christian faces trials. And, and, and so listen, we can't tell people how God did something miraculous if we never need a miracle, if we just lean on our own understanding, if we just do life. I mean, I want you to look at how Paul views himself in this negative situation. Do you realize that from now chapter 22 until the rest of Paul's life, he is going to be a prisoner until his death, until he sees Jesus face to face. So when you're in your Bible studies and you're reading the book of Ephesians, when, when you're reading Philippians, when you're reading the book of Colossians or Timothy or Titus, when you're reading Philemon, Philemon you are reading it from a prisoner's hand where the Holy Spirit is working in Paul in prison as he is pouring into him to pour out of him for what we enjoy today. And I want you to look at Paul's perspective. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 20, Paul says, I am an ambassador in Christ. He's not, his attitude is not, woe is me. I'm in prison. I've been falsely accused. This is injustice. That's not his attitude. In fact, in Philippians 1 and verse 13, he says, so that it has become known, this is a testimony, it has been known throughout the whole imperial guard in Rome and to all the rest that my imprisonment, watch this, is for Christ. So Christ can be glorified. People, he's, he's saying this, people are getting saved in prison, they're getting saved in, in, in Caesar's household, God is on the move. God is working. I'm an ambassador. God is using me, and he's using me powerfully, and, and he's telling the church, praise God. Amen. It's amazing. In Colossians 4, 3, at the same time, he says, pray for us that God may open to us a door for the word. What door? You're in prison. 
you're, you're a prisoner. He says, watch what he says, to declare the mystery of Christ on account which I am in prison. In Acts 20, he says, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit. We talked about this. He knew if he went to Jerusalem, something not good was going to happen. And he says, not knowing, I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I, I know that I'm an ambassador for Christ, and I know God has a purpose for me, and so I'm going to trust in God's will. He says, I'm a prisoner because this is where God wants me to be, and I accept it. Many times when we face negative situations, we become bitter towards God. We blame God. We, we feel neglected. We feel unloved by God. These are natural feelings because it, we go through and you in this room have gone or are going through some hard things. And some of you in this room, we, 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 you don't understand why. And sometimes what can happen through our own emotions is we can feel that God has neglected us, but I'm here to tell you today that that is just not true. The Bible says he will never leave us, never forsake us. Listen, if God has at the very least allowed us to be put in a situation, then he has something wonderful he wants to do from it. Remember, we can't have a testimony without a test. In fact, David said this, King David, as he is walking through some hardship in Psalm 27, verse one, he says this, even though I'm in a negative situation, even though I don't understand it, I do know this, the Lord is my light, he says, and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life, of who shall I be afraid? I, I have a picture of this where, 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 where David is, is following that lion. He's following that lion of Judah, and there's a confidence, even though he doesn't know why. Even though his, his own empire that God has put him over as king is, is, is being attacked, is being pummeled. He doesn't understand it, but, but he says the Lord will be my stronghold. I know that if God has me here, he's going to do something amazing. He says, when evildoers assail me, they eat up my flesh, my adversaries, my foes. It is they who are going to stumble and fall. Though an army encamped against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. What an awesome way to live if we could. What an awesome way to live. And this is how God has ordained us to live. These are the principles that he gives us. He didn't promise that we would walk without trial, but he did promise that he would go before us, Amen. that he would give us supernatural wisdom, that he would give us strength, that he would never leave us nor forsake us. When we're walking with the Lord, we can have that kind of confidence, and that is what is holding up the Apostle Paul as he was beaten for no reason. He's up against a riot, He's falsely accused. There's thoughts of imprisonment in his mind. And church, trials and testing and situation will come. Some of them God has designed and developed to shape and mold us and to strengthen us. Others he allowed at the very least. You say, no, Dale, this is from the enemy. Listen, the devil is not free to do in my life or your life whatever he wants. That's biblical. I don't care what anyone says. And we can sit down and, and look at that. Listen, the devil is not free to do whatever he wants in our lives. Jesus said, I hold the keys of hell, death, and the grave. He is in charge. He is greater than any other gods. So how could any other god do something to us that Jehovah God didn't at the very least allow. The, the enemy will try to work evil in this world because of sin. Sin is, is rampant through this world. We know there's going to be a time where God, as he comes down, is going to eradicate that when he comes back once and for all. But what the enemy, even while we're living on this earth, 
has meant for destruction, has meant for divorce, has meant to shake us up and down. God, the Bible says, is able to take that and work that for good. He is able to bring life somehow, some way, because of who he is. And we are righteous only because he is righteous. So remember that lion, that lion going before us. We need to put our hope and trust in him. Well, secondly, negative situations are a platform for opportunities. You come to chapter 22 now and the stage is set. God gives us a platform for opportunities to glorify his name. And so here is Paul. He's standing up on this platform The Romans had to come and rescue him. He's getting ready to go into the barracks, into hiding for trial. And and, 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 and imagine this. He is is no doubt bruised and beat, bloodied, possibly broken ribs, wondering what in the world is going on. But now he takes this opportunity and it's a platform now for him to share the gospel. And here's what he says in verse one. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet and said, and he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as you are to this day. I mean, what a great beginning. This, this man has just been beaten by these people. And, and with a gentle spirit, he stands and begins to approach them. He uses the platform to show the character of Jesus Christ. It's absolutely amazing because the charges against him are bogus. They're absolutely false. We see the charges that happen. We read it together in Acts chapter 21 and verse 28. All of a sudden, a couple guys try to stir trouble in this massive crowd. They cry out for help. They cry wolf. And they say, this is a man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people. What people? The Jews against the law, in other words, against the word of God, and, 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 and Jerusalem. Moreover, he has brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. So here's what they're saying. This guy, Paul, is anti-Semitic. They begin to throw out racial slurs, and, and Paul says, wait a minute. He stands before them and says, guys, that's, and think about what you're saying. I'm a Jew. I I love the Jewish people. He begins to take a negative situation and begins to open their eyes. And as he keeps talking, he opens their eyes to Jesus because he's portraying the character of Christ in this negative situation and using it for a platform. And think about something else. When Jesus was falsely accused, when he was beaten, when he was flogged, when he was spit upon and sentenced to die, I mean, I would say that's a pretty negative situation to be in, getting ready to go to Calvary. And what did Jesus Christ do? He used that negative situation as an opportunity to do what? Glorify God the Father. And he is our example. He died for our sin, and maybe you're thinking because you're in this situation that God has abandoned you, and those thoughts keep coming through your mind today. That is just not true. Possibly, God, Christ, is setting the stage, setting the opportunity for you to glorify his name in that trial that you are facing. And when people see you empowered, when people see the negative, but then the positive is added on through the word of God, through the principles of the word, and they see you, and they understand that something's happening in you. 
You're ignited by the Spirit of God. You're trusting God. There's a supernatural joy about you. And people are going to look at you in that negative situation and say, how are they doing that? How how do they walk like that? How do they keep their senses? How do they keep their calm? How are they not going crazy? I know what they're walking through. How can they not be taking so many uh, uh, pills to just numb the pain? If I was walking through that situation, I'll tell you what, I'd get a gun and blow my head off. I don't know what, how they're living. It's because of what's in them. It's, it's, it's because of of, of principles of the word that they're seeing. And, and, and this, is what's, this is what's happening with Paul. This is what can be happening with me or with you. Listen, our life will change someone else's life when we allow the Spirit of God to take a trial or a negative situation and turn it into a positive testimony. Amen. Before this message, you saw Tawan, uh, our, our creative director's work, as he begin to, to show the theme for the year. And this, this woman, this actor, Regina is her name. And, and you saw the, the broken pieces of glass because her family was in trouble. Her, her, her marriage was a wreck. Her kids are seeing this happen. She, she's distraught. She doesn't know what to do. And all of a sudden, something's stirring in her. She goes what? To the word of God, Right? And you saw her blow the dust off the Bible because she's not trusting in God. She doesn't have the power. She's not using the situations that she is in to to use it as a platform to, to change lives. Not trusting in God. And and so we see her blowing off that dust off the Bible and allowing the word of God to ignite something in her, to do something in her that she can't fix herself. She can't fix her marriage herself. She can't fix the demons in her mind herself. She can't change her situation herself. And so as she breathes that and, and opens the word of God, God ignites something inside of her and now she she realizes that and now this part two that tawan filmed she she's changed maybe her situation didn't change but she's trusting now in god she's she's realizing god my marriage is a wreck and so i need to do something about it with you and i need to change some things and i need to go out into this the city and tell people about you because I need to use this situation even though I don't know how to fix it myself as a platform to change others' lives because God is the only one who can do that. Hey, that's our heart. That's what we want for River of Life. And, And listen, another way as we're moving in that direction to turn a negative situation into a positive testimony, when we get out there, whether it's the workplace, in the school system, with friends, family, we have to find common ground. We have to find common ground. I mean, I get uncomfortable when I see Christians picketing and protesting and using Facebook and Twitter as a platform for all their rhetoric and and, and name-calling. You know, in, 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 in insulting arguments in the name of Christianity. Insulting people and, and, and trying to get their point and their dogma across so harshly in the name of, of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you, at least what I'm reading, none of it sounds like Jesus. None, it's no place for the church, nor the Christian. Listen, if you can't build a bridge with somebody, then don't burn one. If you can't build a bridge when it comes to your life and your character, honoring God and and being Christ-like, then for the love of God, don't burn one. Listen, wouldn't it be better to reach out to the person who is thinking about having an abortion 
than, than saying harsh things or carrying a sign that says John 3.16? Come on. Or you kill babies and stuff like that? All, all that rhetoric? I mean, isn't it better to, to show the love and character of God with someone who is struggling with their, with their sexuality than, than, than calling them names and, and trying to bring a harshness to someone you may not even know and you plug your thoughts on Facebook or make a statement on, on Twitter? I mean, it, listen, that doesn't do anything. That draws people away from the gospel. It draws them away from knowing who God really is. Listen, let God do from the inside out what we could never do with our religious piety. Listen, church, how can we gain a hearing? And this is what Paul was doing here. How can we gain a hearing for the gospel if we make enemies of the people that Jesus Christ called us to love? We, we can't. Here's Paul. He realizes you have to find common ground, and it's so important here to show meekness. As he shares his apology, because that's what it is, when he shares his testimony, he, he's doing it with such meekness. And, and I'm not talking about just rolling over and not sharing truth. Meekness, biblically, is the, defined this way. Strength under control. So there's nothing to be ashamed of. You are a man, you are a woman, when you can actually show meekness in a situation, finding common ground where you don't always have to be right. I mean, when people argue with me about theology, and I know it's going nowhere. I know what is going to come. I've been in ministry long enough where, you know what, I don't have to share that, my opinion. Say, so you know what, man, I, I, let's, let's find something we can actually agree upon. And let's hone in, let's hone in on that. Build a bridge with people. Start relationships. We can't pour gas on the fire and incite people. And it seems like that's what the church of the living God is doing today. Listen, here is Paul, and he is very careful to try to find common ground with people we, who, who have been his enemy, who have misunderstood him who have misunderstood his message. And so he shares with them, hey, I'm a Jew. I'm an educated man. I want you to know that I was trained under Gamaliel. And they know who he is. He was the greatest professor, theologian, teacher of that day. And Paul says, I was, I was a tutor under him. We can find some ground. Do you, can you respect me enough now that I'm going to get ready to share with you the gospel? I'm going to share with you my testimony. I'm not anti-Semitic. I'm not prejudiced. This is who I am. And, and he goes on to say, listen, according, Gamaliel taught me in a strict manner of the law, of people you respect. I respect Abraham. I respect Isaac. I, I respect Moses. I respect Jacob. I know the law. I was just, and here's what he's doing. I was just like you. I was very zealous for God. Even though I didn't realize Messiah had come. And so all these people that were following Jesus, I was just trying to protect the law. And I know you're zealous, and I know you're angry, and, and I got the bruises to prove it. But he finds common ground. He, and, and listen, we can't reach people if we just focus on the negative and we don't bring them the positive testimony of Jesus Christ through what we have walked through. We have to build a bridge even though people hurt us even though people malign us, even though we disagree with even political issues. We, we can get so bent out of shape on political views that the, 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 the flesh comes out of us. I mean, not, I'm not saying it's the, the demonic, but the flesh. And we, and we get 
so much into those things that we lose the character of Christ in our arguments. And we, we burn bridges. The fact of the matter is our human nature is one that says, if you are nice to me, I will be nice to you. If you respect me, I will respect you. But you know what? People, that who, are, people who are without Jesus Christ can do that. I mean, if, if, if you only love those who love you, what do you do more than people who don't even, aren't even Christians? I mean, remember what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And in verse 46, he says, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? None. Do, do not even the tax collectors who were supposedly wicked people, don't they even do that? And, and if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Don't even the Gentiles, don't even people who don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, this is what Jesus is saying, they don't know God, they don't know Jehovah, don't they do that? So our job is to build a bridge. So the next time you are in a negative situation and someone may be maligning you and someone is treating you wrong, try to find common ground. Reach out to them in gentleness, in meekness. Here is Paul, and he begins to share his testimony. He says, I, in verse four, I persecuted this way. In other words, when it says way with the capital, it's the church, it's the church of Jesus Christ. It was called the way. He says, I persecuted them to death, binding and delivering both in prison men and women as the high priest and the whole council of elders bear witness with me. For them I received letters to the brothers and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to punish them. Now, Paul does another thing that, that opens up a negative situation to the positive, and that is he shares what God has done with him. And he begins to share what God has done with him in his life. One of the ways we begin to build a positive testimony is sooner or later, we have to tell people what God has done for us in our life. Where God has delivered, where God has helped, where God has restored something in you. It could be something really, really big, or it could be something small but to that other person when you begin to share with them your life it is going to open the door for the holy spirit to ignite truth in them and reveal who jesus christ is and this is what paul is doing in verse 6 he says as i was on my way to damascus about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone down at me on me as he's going to kill christians as he's going to kill the church jesus comes this, this supernatural light. We know it's supernatural because it's noontime. And in noon, it's sunny. That's why Paul says this. And so it's a supernatural light. It was the Shekinah glory of God. Jesus at that moment appears to Paul. And watch what happens. The Bible says in verse seven, he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, watch this, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now, those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. In Acts chapter 9, it tells us that they heard the sound, they just didn't see anyone. So this is something that is supernatural. All of a sudden, Paul Paul sees this, and as we read this, we can overlook something, I think, very powerful here. Here is Paul, and the very person that he thinks is dead, that he thinks was a false prophet, a false teacher, trying to destroy the law, this Jesus of Nazareth. He's killing people. He's putting people in prison. He's riding on his horse. This supernatural light comes down. This voice says, hey, I'm Jesus. I mean, can you imagine that? And, and all of a sudden, he is blinded at that moment from the light. You see that in verses 10 and verses 11. And I just want to suggest to you, not only did Paul see God's glory, but he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, how do you know that, Dale? 
In verse 14, it says, and he said, the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will. Watch this, to see the righteous one. Who's the righteous one? Jesus, right? He says, I am righteous and you are righteous only because I am. That's Jesus. He saw Jesus, look it, and heard his voice through that light. And so I don't know if you've ever done this before, but have you ever seen a light and it was so bright and then the image that you saw last was in your, in your mind, right? Was in your thing. This is, uh, I don't know what this is. This is something, Christian. Close your, now Christian's got, my son's going to see me for like hours. But, but, oh, now when you see this is what is happening. Paul see, I won't do it to you, Brittany. Paul sees this light. Now you, can you see me when you close your eyes? Yes, you can. So he sees this light and it's supernatural. It's amazing. It's so bright. And, and, and the Bible says he's blind for three days. And you know what he saw for three days? The face of Jesus. And Jesus is ministering to him. Jesus is saying, hey, you are doing good. You, 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 I'm going to use you. I know you think this is bad. I know you think this is negative. I know you think this is the end. But I am going to work in you. The Bible says, as you read on in chapter 22, God says, I have a plan for your life. And you are going to share my truth you are going to share salvation to the gentiles and people are going to get saved and people are going to get on fire for god and for me and now the one you have persecuted you are going to uplift and talk about which leads us to the last thing and that is our purpose jesus christ shown showed paul his purpose through a negative situation and he never forgot it. He's now in another negative situation because we saw in the beginning of this message that we are going to face trials constantly in our life. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2, though, tells us something amazing in verse 10. But we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. In other words, when we accept Christ as our Savior, there are things, specific things, that God wants to do in my life and your life. Amen. From the first day you became a Christian to the day you see Jesus face to face, there are specific things that you and I are going to be called to do. That's why last, the last two weeks we talked about understanding and hearing the voice of God. Because it's so important. We have a purpose in life. God said in verse 10, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand, before we were created. Why? That we should walk in them. In other words, that we should fulfill them. So here we go. What is your purpose? What is, what is your calling? See, God doesn't just call preachers. Sometimes we use that word call and we think of a preacher or an evangelist or, or a missionary. And that's, I don't know where we got caught up in that biblically. But God calls everyone who accepts him as savior he calls teachers construction workers computer engineers doctors lawyers salespeople, housewives whatever you do for a living it doesn't matter god calls everyone who receives receives him as savior and a lot of people miss turning a negative situation into a positive testimony because they don't realize that they have a purpose. They don't realize their calling. And so when they face a negative situation, they get all bent out of shape and rely on their own understanding and their own feelings and don't walk by the word of God and therefore have a negative view of God, a negative perspective of God, a ne negative perspective of people. Some people have been hurt so much, and maybe you're here this morning, and that's you, where you don't trust anybody. You don't trust people. It doesn't matter if they're Christian or not, because you've been hurt. 
And not just once, not just twice, but over again. And, and now when you become into a negative situation, you miss the, the platform, you miss the opportunity, you miss your purpose, you miss your calling. Because that part's off, and this is all you're seeing. So you're a Christian with no power. You're a Christian with no wisdom. You're a Christian with no supernatural knowledge. You're a Christian without any hope. You become bitter. You've allowed the negativities of life to overwhelm you to the point where you are absorbed now into the thinking of the world and going to church and then doing life all over again. God has something more for us. He has something more. We have to listen to his voice. We have to know the purpose that we were created for. You were created uniquely, special, all of us. You say, Dale, listen, my purpose is to make money. My purpose is to provide for my family. My purpose is to raise my children, and, and that's my purpose in life. Listen, again, even those without Christ do that, and they do it very well, and they do it with excellence. They love their children. They want to raise them right. They want to provide for their family and have the best for them if they can do it and afford it. The difference is, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, are we to do that? Yes. But there's more. There's specific things that God has created you and I for uniquely purposed in us and he's going to bring us through trials and tribulations and things we don't understand and it's going to be unique to us you're going to experience things and difficulties that i won't and i'm going to experience difficulties and situations that you may not but god has a purpose for both of us and and the secret is how do we take the negative things the trials the situations that are going to happen in life and connect them to the Spirit of God, connect them to the Word, where we are going to be ignited and we're going to see and find our purpose. My prayer is that all of us, all of us are going to get before the Lord and say, God, help us. Help me. Help me take what I'm walking through today or tomorrow, maybe even next year, wherever it is, and help me to keep my eyes and fixed on you because I want the platform that I walk through to exalt you in your name. I want to have a testimony. I want my life to matter. I want it to count. God, I'm listening for you. I'm, I'm, I'm eager. I'm anticipating all that you have for me because I am perfectly and wonderfully made. You crafted me, my personality, my abilities. You've given to me for a reason. I need to find them out beyond just being a good parent, a good husband, a good wife, a provider. Beyond that, that's great and we need to start there, but there's much more. 